Hello, in this video, I am going to talk about the real side effects of the aromatase inhibitors. Before I go on, I'd love to invite you to subscribe to our channel. We are always putting out new content, usually in response to the questions that we get. We get about 200 comments a week. We try to get back to you within one to two weeks, and we appreciate that engagement. It gives us ideas about what to cover, and it helps us feel really connected with you. So if you have a question, it's very likely somebody else does as well, and you're giving to other people who are going through the same thing. I'd also love to invite you to go to yerba.com to get your personalized report. I'm talking about aromatase inhibitors in this video. Do you know if that's going to be part of your plan? What are the pros and cons? Your Yerba report goes through all of your medical records after you give us permission, and it takes those records and cross-references it with the latest medical evidence and generates for you a report of everything we know about the tumor, the treatment things and options you might hear about when you go see the doctor, and the pros and cons of each, as well as some suggestions for what you can ask the doctor when you go see them. So yerba.com to get your personalized yerba report. So if you have been prescribed an aromatase inhibitor, or if you have watched this channel and know about the side effects of aromatase inhibitors, you have very likely heard about joint pains and aches, sometimes muscle pain, and I'll get more into those in just a moment. You've heard about vaginal dryness. You may hear about hot flashes or night sweats. Some doctors will talk about the possibility of a decrease in your bone mineral density, which can lead to osteopenia, light bones, or osteoporosis, really light bones. But what does all this really mean? And what about the side effects that you don't hear about until you experience them and then you drop a comment in Yerba? So I'm gonna go through the side effects that I've listed plus a couple more and try to address what we actually see and hear from real people. Then I will talk about why you didn't hear about this sooner. I have thoughts about that. And then at the end, I'm going to ask you the fundamental question and help you ask that. Is it all worth it? Is it worth even going on these medications? So please stay tuned to the end because I think that will make things make more sense for you. So the side effects I'm gonna cover, if you heard about them in a patient information sheet, or let's say you've seen them on a television ad, what you're hearing is things like joint pain. What you don't hear about is the emotional toll and the impact on your daily life. So my hope is to go through these and validate and also educate your experience, whether it's presently experienced, whether it's in the past, or whether you're about to embark on an aromatase inhibitor. Let's start with joint pains. This is the most common side effect of the aromatase inhibitors. We're not just talking about an ache and pain like you, you know, um, stubbed your toe or you've overused your elbow. For many people, these are mild pains. They're in the hands, the wrists, the shoulders, the hips, the feet, and they go away after 20 minutes. That's a very typical pattern, is that with movement and getting up and moving, people feel better. If you've had a long car ride and you get out, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna be pretty present, and then after you get moving, they'll be gone. For some people, though, we have heard words like crippling, agony, can't live like this, I feel like I'm 90 and I'm only 50, we even hear this from 90-year-olds, I feel like I'm 90 and I never did before. We're hearing major impact on people's quality of life, their ability to live their life and enjoy their life and to do things they enjoy. If you don't have these side effects, don't worry, the medication's still worry, working. If you are having them, we see you and we hear you. It can also be difficult with aromatase inhibitors to do your daily functioning. And we know that chronic pain can lead to chronic fatigue. So one of the things we hear is that 
people are exhausted. It doesn't take even getting to the end of the day. It can be around two o'clock in the day, they're exhausted just because they're pushing through the pain because movement does make it better, because they don't want to restrict their activities. But it's very common for people to be fatigued because of those even low level pains can chip away at our energy. In one study looking at people who stopped their aromatase inhibitors, 20 to 30% of people came off the drug and the main reason, 70%, said it was because of the joint aches and pains. And I say both because some people describe it as an ache and some as pain. Some people who don't wanna complain or report will call it discomfort, but it truly is pain. So I'm going to talk briefly about things you can do for joint pains from aromatase inhibitors and frankly from most causes of joint pain, including tamoxifen. The most important thing, the most reliable thing, and you've confirmed that in the comments, is some movement. And that movement can be doing stretches in bed. You can do cat-cow, a nice bone uh, back muscle relaxer in the morning. You can do child's pose and that can really help you get moving in the morning. Starting with walking is one of the most helpful things. See if you can fit in a 10 minute walk even before you get in the shower. That can be very helpful just to get things moving and it's very predictable. For people it's going to help, they actually find that if they don't exercise, the pain is even worse. And I, if you've watched for a while, you know I don't love the word exercise, I like the word movement. Exercise sounds messy and sweaty and like it has to take an hour. Movement can take five, 10 minutes. Just something, you can, you can flow, you can move your arms around, yoga, dance, something, anything that makes you move all your joints in your body. The other thing that you can do is apply heat. So a warm heating pad to the areas that hurt or a warm shower has been very helpful for people. Some people take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like naproxen or ibuprofen. Check with your doctor if you're on a lot of other medicines to make sure there's no interaction or if you've had stomach problems like ulcers or reflux. So non-steroidals. There's also a medication called duloxetine, which was first brought out as an antidepressant, but can work really well for people. About 70% of people on duloxetine can have relief of their joint pains, if not complete relief, enough relief that they're able to function and the pain sort of moves to the back seat of their day. So lots of things that you can try, and we're gonna get to another one towards the end of the video. So just stay tuned. Another thing that you'll hear about is the risk of loss of bone mineral density. I mentioned it at the top, where the bones get thinner, and that happens because the aromatase inhibitors lower estrogen in your body. Even after menopause, you have estrogen in your body. And by lowering that level, the bones are deprived of the estrogen that helps keep them strong. Usually, the osteoporosis, if your nor bones are normal in density, they go down a little bit, so they might go to osteopenia after you've been on the medicine, or if you have osteopenia, the, your bones may go down to osteoporosis. When you come off the medication, your bone mineral density will go up to where it would have been according to your age. So over time, we all lose bone mineral density. You kind of meet the cohort of people that weren't on an aromatase inhibitor. So you sort of fall behind and then you catch up when you come off of it. But this is concerning, right? Hearing that you're at increased risk for fractures is really worrisome. So things that you can do about this is have a DEXA test, a test that looks at your bone mineral density. If you're 50, you just went through menopause, you can wait a little while. But if you are older, you know, 65 and older, and you're going on an aromatase inhibitor, it might make sense to have a DEXA test. Talk with your doctor. If you've had one recently that showed really good bones, you don't need another one. And then it can be done every two years, unless there are reasons to think your bone mineral density is going down. The most effective way to keep your bone minerals density high is to 
exercise with weight bearing exercise. So that's not swimming or biking, but walking with a weighted vest, for example, or walking carrying hand weights, anything where you're putting pressure on your bones. I know it sounds like a bad idea. It's actually the best thing you can do for your bones. We know people in zero gravity environments like out of the Earth's atmosphere lose bone mineral density very quickly. Staying grounded and staying heavy will help your bones be strong. You can also do resistance exercises where you are lifting weights or stretching against bands. That pressure on the bones helps them heal. The other thing to do is to talk with your medical team about vitamin D and calcium supplements. There's a lot of controversy about this. Your physician team, your nurse practitioner, a dietitian will have opinions about this. You don't have to have a vitamin D level checked to be started on vitamin D supplements depending on where you live in the world and how um, far away you are from the equator will determine whether or not you should just be on vitamin D. It's hard to get through food. Another side effect that you may not hear about or hear enough about is AI-induced, aromatase inhibit induced cognitive fog. Some people describe brain fog. The way this looks is people can have a hard time with remembering words. Some people have described not even remembering their own email address, and this is really distressing. The people who notice this the most are people who do crossword puzzles in pen. That's what, these are the people who really have high cognitive demands and whose identity comes through being able to remember names and remember things without having to make a list or remember where they need to be without having to write it in a calendar. In work that's been done by a colleague of mine, those are the people who struggle the most with endocrine therapy related cognitive decline. This isn't talked about a great deal. It's highly variable. There are some studies actually showing cognition is better. And so when you get it, it's going to be hard for you to find information out about this from your team. We thought it was worth mentioning here. Another thing you may not have been told is that you will have things like vaginal dryness. Estrogen helps lubricate the wall of the vagina and the vulva. And when estrogen is cut low, vaginal dryness and even atrophy, thinning of the vaginal skin, will happen. It doesn't happen in everybody. It gets uh, more severe over time. It's not a serious problem in terms of being precancerous or any of the other things that you might be finally attuned to, but boy, does it affect your quality of life, right? If you're having penetrative sex or even non-penetrative intercourse and during intimacy, it will be tender. Any pressure can be tender and that can make us recoil from intimacy because if it hurts, we're going to have an automatic reaction. This can affect your relationships. You might not want to be physically intimate and your partner might, and this may feel like a wedge between you. We have other videos on how to talk to your partner about this. This is really important. Please don't let anybody minimize this. People will say, well, you're free of your cancer, so you don't need to have sex. Sex is an important functional part of relationships. The other thing that can happen and highly related is a loss of libido. Libido is sort of your interest in sex. You are not letting your partner down. You have gone through and are going through something that's life altering. So there needs to be some work in the partnership. If you're dating, there needs to be conversations. My thought is, if you can't talk about intimacy, should you be intimate? If you're not comfortable enough to talk with your partner about intimacy, why is it so much easier just to be intimate? Something to think about. I heard that when I was a young woman and it stayed with me ever since. That talking about sex is actually pretty sexy and it can have you have that shared closeness that I think is a prerequisite for a good intimate life. Okay, a couple more things. Fatigue I mentioned. Fatigue because of pain, but people also see fatigue from just the drug itself and problems sleeping, and they all interrelate to one another. So if you're having hot flashes in the middle of the night, even if it doesn't wake you up, it's been shown it affects your sleep quality. If you're hurting and if you're on the medication without anything else, you can get fatigue. I think it's possible to overcome this, and there are ways to do that, being out in natural light, 
exercise even if you don't feel like it, finding moments of joy, listening to your body, taking breaks, and not having in your head you have to be superwoman. Keep doing everything. Just talk tenderly to yourself. Sleep problems warrant, actually all of these do, warrant a discussion with your doctor because there are all kinds of things you can do, like switching the time of the day you take your medication. There's not a real scientific reason why that should help because your blood level is really steady, but it actually works. And the last thing that I wanted to cover today, and this is not a 100% complete list, but things we hear are not addressed enough. The other thing is irritability. And you can imagine having listened to everything I've just said about fatigue and cognitive problems and joint pain and lack of libido and lack of sex, all of these can make you irritable. But even without all of those things, these medications are associated with irritability. Practicing kindness, practicing good self-talk, getting help, asking for help when you need it, telling your medical team this is going on, all of these things are important. Don't wait until they're very bad. All right, I'm gonna move briefly into why do doctors not tell you all of this? Well, one thing I can tell you is that when we tell patients every single thing that can happen, all they hear is the first thing. We know there's sort of a tipping point at which patients stop hearing us. And this doesn't matter whether you're a physician yourself, you have a PhD in molecular biology, you're the president of some organization. No matter your cognitive brilliance, you can only take in a certain amount of information. So we often will say the side effects that we see people come off the medication with, we do know that doctors give less information about side effects to people with whom they have social distance. So for example, a white doctor with a black patient is less likely to give a thorough list of side effects. They will give you a piece of paper, but they're less likely to go through all of those for fears of scaring you. And actually doctors will hold back because they want you to at least try the medicine and they trust you're going to read the information that they give you. That information is usually on one or two pages and doesn't go into the depth that we have. That's where Yerba comes in. That's where our channel comes in, where you help and support each other and share information. And the last question is, if it's so bad, why am I staying on them? Well, if you're really suffering, the first thing to try is switching to a different aromatase inhibitor. This helps a surprising number of people. If you don't believe me, go back and look through the comments. There are so many people who've taken time out of their day to say, this helped me. There are three aromatase inhibitors. You can switch from one to the other. Usually, if you don't tolerate two, you won't tolerate the third one, but it's always worth a try. The second thing is almost all of these symptoms are manageable, even severe joint pain, even sexual dysfunction. Most of these are manageable. These drugs are life-saving. These drugs are a major advance in the treatment of hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So I would encourage you to learn about the risks and benefits. Try the medication. You won't know how you're going to feel, and you might be one of the people who feels just fine on it. I have covered a lot. This is one of our longest videos. Go back and watch it if you want. Watch our other videos on endocrine therapy. We cover many of the things that I didn't cover today and how to manage them. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.